In 1991, a 15-year-old schoolgirl goes missing from the Scottish town of Bathgate. It was devastated. Everybody was devastated. We just were all feared the worst. Just six months later, and hundreds of miles away in the southeast of England, an 18-year-old student would also simply disappear. We knew pretty much straight away when she hadn't come home that something serious had happened. Despite tireless investigations by the police, the whereabouts of both girls remained a mystery until 16 years later, when the brutal murder of a Polish student living in Glasgow would lead to a national manhunt that would uncover one of Britain's most notorious murderers. This is a horrible, dangerous individual that has no respect for life. I'm Dermot Murnahan in the death and destruction wrought by Peter Tobin and the tragic legacy of potentially more as yet undiscovered victims are crimes that shook Britain. Bathgate in Scotland, just a 45-minute drive from the hustle and bustle of Edinburgh. In 1991, this town would become the central focus of the biggest missing persons investigation in Scottish history, following the disappearance of 15-year-old schoolgirl Vicky Hamilton. Vicky was a teenager from the Falkirk area of Scotland, um, a very normal teenager. She lived at home with her mother, her younger brother and sister. She was educated at high school in Falkirk and was a very popular girl. On the weekend of the 10th of February 1991, Vicky was returning home after a weekend at her sister's house in nearby Livingston. The hour-long journey to Falkirk would require her to change buses in the centre of Bathgate. From the start, she, she wanted to do this on her own. She was getting independent, you know, and wants to... Right in the big world, she's basically. And when she left Livingston that night, uh, her sister put her on the bus and she got to Bathgate and after Bathgate, that was it, nobody had seen her. Vicky alighted from the bus in the steel yard. She was supposed to be going to the bus stop opposite the police station. We know that Vicky started to make that journey. We also know that she went to the chip shop where she bought chips and that she sat on a seat in the steel yard, which was really the last sighting of Vicky. I can remember as though it was yesterday, aye? Well, it was one of the biggest searches in Scotland. Um, the stop traffic in Bathgate, by pamphlets. I spoke to a lot of drivers that left Bathgate that night trains that left, buses that left, but, I mean, the public were, they were really helpful. It was in all the pubs, people speaking about it, you know, and no, there was nothing come of it. The only potential clue that police had about Vicky's whereabouts was found 20 miles away in the Scottish capital. A week after Vicky Hamilton went missing, her purse was found in St Andrew's Square in Edinburgh. The purse was examined at that time forensically with the techniques that were available. Um, however, nothing was found on the purse. With no other leads to follow, extensive inquiries were held on the streets of Bathgate, but the police could find no details about Vicky's final movements. It was devastating. Everybody was devastated. We just we all feared the worst. Uh, we, we knew there's some sinister had happened uh, because there's no way she would have done what she did. She just disappeared. Glasgow in 2006 and 15 years after the disappearance of Vicky Hamilton, another young girl would also be reported missing, a Polish student by the name of Angelika Kluk. Angelica came to Glasgow to better herself, to improve her education. She spoke various languages. She was trusting 
lovely, intelligent, young woman. Angelica was spending her second summer in the city and was staying here, in the living quarters attached to St. Patrick's, a busy Catholic church in the Anderston area of Glasgow. The church was a well-known destination for people who needed a safe place to stay. In 2006, another person looking for shelter arrived at the church. A man by the name of Patrick McLaughlin. Pat McLaughlin worked at the church, sort of handyman, done bits and pieces. He painted a room, he put up a shed, he painted the garage door. He did do a good job with these things he was doing, you know, and he'd done other bits and bobs, whatever, for a Jerry, for a Jerry needed probably turn his hand to it. With Angelica living at St. Patrick's and Pat McLaughlin helping out at the church, it was inevitable that the two became acquainted. He referred to her as his apprentice, and she was someone that trusted this person. He befriended her. She had not that many friends within the church, but she got on well with him and she trusted him. But behind McLaughlin's likeable demeanour lay a criminal past dating back decades, and his arrival at St. Patrick's would set in motion a chain of events leading to one of the biggest police murder inquiries that Britain had ever seen. It all began on the 25th of September 2006 when Angelica Kluck was reported missing. Police questioned all of the parishioners that knew her, and that included the church handyman. McLaughlin claimed to know nothing about her disappearance and was allowed to leave. But when he didn't turn up for work the following day, the police became increasingly suspicious. To help find him, they turned to charity worker Dennis Curran. Everybody that works in our charity had a, a badge with a photograph on it. So that included Pam McLaughlin. And I get his photograph took. And that's the photograph he gave to the police. And that's the photograph they put on television. Police have released a photograph of a man they want to speak to in connection with the disappearance of a Polish student in Glasgow. Pat McLaughlin is known to have spent time with Angelica Kluck on Sunday. The 23-year-old hasn't been seen since. That was at three o'clock on the Tuesday afternoon and at six o'clock it went nationwide. Prompted by the release of the picture, police were inundated with information. And one of the calls they received made a startling claim. The photograph went out, and then it was learned that this person was not Patrick McLaughlin, he was the missing sex offender, Peter Tobin. Peter Tobin had previously been convicted of a string of sex offences, but had since disappeared after attacking a young woman in 2005. Now, not only was a convicted sexual predator on the loose, but it appeared he was one of the last people to see Angelica Kluke before she went missing. Next on Crimes That Shook Britain, Tobin is tracked down, and the veil of lies and deception that hit one of Britain's worst killers begins to lift. Is there any way that you can assist us in finding this girl now? As I say, I've never met her. Fifteen years after the disappearance of Falkirk teenager Vicky Hamilton, police in Glasgow received reports of a missing 23-year-old called Angelica Kluke. Concerned for her safety, they conducted interviews with people she'd most recently been in contact with, and one of those people was a church handyman called Pat McLaughlin. But hours after he was questioned by police, he disappeared. So eager to track him down, detectives in Glasgow issued a public appeal. And what they discovered was truly shocking. When it was established that the last person that Angelica Kluck had been seen with was not who he said he was, Patrick McLaughlin, he was the missing sex offender, Peter Tobin. That is when we arranged another search of the church. And in that evening, Angelica's body was found concealed under the floorboards of the church. 
An examination of the interior of the church resulted in a gruesome discovery. The floor near the font included a trapdoor. That led to a small underground space that contained a mass of plastic bags and tarpaulin. They in turn covered the bloodied remains of Angelica Kluck. Now a murder inquiry. Forensic scientists were called in to provide any clues as to who the killer might be. The first step was to go and look at the hatch so I could assess in person what the, the crime scene entailed. And I could see Angelica's body. She was actually directly beneath the trapdoor. She had her legs bent under her from her knees. She was partially obscured with bin bags and tarpaulin. I could see her hands and I could see that they were tied with cable ties. I could see her trousers were unfastened. I couldn't see her face at that point, but I could see a lot of blood on her hands. The next stage was then to go down the hatch itself and standing, looking down at the hatch, it looked tiny. And I remember it was that narrow that I had a pager on my waistband and I couldn't fit down with the pager still on my waistband. That's how little room there was. And I sat beside Angelica and then started work. It was very apparent at that point that it had been a violent death and that, the, that, that she had been injured really badly. Carol Rogers spent almost three hours under the church floor gathering crucial forensic evidence. Almost immediately, she was able to provide detectives with vital information. We realised pretty quickly that this was what we would term a deposition site as opposed to the attack site where Angelica had initially been attacked. It was apparent because of really the way the blood was flowing in Angelica's body. It was also such a tight, confined space, it would be difficult to imagine how an assault could be carried out in such a confined space. So the next stage, crime scene-wise, was to try and establish where Angelica had been assaulted, where the initial assault had occurred. We started off by looking at the garage of the workshop, which is attached to the church, because that's where Angelica was last seen. This is a garage that's full of furniture, paint, all sorts of bits and pieces. So it's a case of going through it and looking at all the items and trying to see any evidence of an assault. And then we noticed a tiny blood spot, a blood spot probably a couple of millimetres in diameter on the concrete floor. And once we saw one, we saw another one and another one. So we started circling them with a black pen and within about 10 minutes we had tens of circles on the floor. And that, in our opinion, was impact spatter and this was where Angelica had been assaulted. Once we'd found the impact spatter on the floor, we started looking at the walls and the ceiling and we saw impact spatter radiating up the brick walls. And we also saw cast off blood on the ceiling. And cast off blood occurs when a weapon has been used. And if a weapon is used to strike someone, as the weapon becomes more and more covered with blood, every time the weapon's moved back and swung back, the action of swinging the weapon and the weapon coming to a halt at the end of the swing cast blood off and cast off blood on the ceiling is a really good indication that a weapon with a bit of length has been used. And as it turned out, a table leg had been used. Police now knew exactly where and how Angelica Kluke had been killed. And in church handyman Peter Tobin, they had a prime suspect. Tobin was born in 1946 near Glasgow and had a troubled childhood, spending time in a young offenders institute. He would go on to marry three times and have two children. Over the years, his various ex-wives would claim Tobin subjected them to physical and mental abuse. Looking into his background, we found out that Tobin had started very young. He started in sort of minor crime, petty crime, however. His index offence uh, it was in the early 90s, and that was when it was serious sexual offences against two young girls in Havant. The teenage girls, one 14, the other 15, were reported missing by their parents at 9.30 on Wednesday evening. Both were raped. The 14-year-old suffered serious injuries during the attack. Police today took the unusual step of naming the man they want to question, 46-year-old Peter Tobin. Police are appealing to Mr. Tobin to come forward. They want anyone with any information about him to contact their local police station. 
Following the sexual assaults of the two girls in 1993, Peter Tobin went on the run before he was eventually caught by police and sentenced to 14 years in prison. He was released after just nine, though, and returned to live in his hometown of Paisley before vanishing without warning in October 2005, suspected of yet another attack on a woman. He would resurface in Glasgow using the alias Patrick McLaughlin a year later before deciding to flee again, aware that the spotlight was beginning to focus on him as a suspect in Angelica's murder. The last time I saw him, you would never have known that anything had happened. He was just his normal self. The only thing that was a wee bit off was when we were having my meal and he kept getting up and looking out the window and up and looking in the window and he said he was like, I said, what's the matter with you? He says, oh, I'm, I'm waiting for my mate coming. He said he'd be here about half seven or something. Looking back now, I think he's looking to see if there's any police fans coming or anything like that, you know. Aware of his true identity, finding Peter Tobin became the police's number one priority. Appeals for Peter Tobin were put out nationwide. Mr Tobin is considered a potential risk to members of the public. Any person who sees this man is advised not to approach him. And very quickly, a nurse in a hospital in London recognised an individual who was checked into a hospital in a different name. Complaining of serious chest pains and now using the name James Kelly, Tobin had admitted himself into this London hospital, an action that would lead to his eventual arrest. The hospital contacted the police, a metropolitan police officer attended, he recognised him, interviewed him, cautioned him, and Tobin admitted to who he was and said that he knew why they were looking for him. For me, that was the defining moment of this investigation. And for me, a defining moment, something that I will always remember for the rest of my life. Peter Tobin was arrested on the 30th of September 2006, the very day that Angelica Kluke's body was removed from beneath the floorboards of St. Patrick's Church. But police still needed to prove that he was the man responsible for her brutal murder. We had a DNA profile from Seaman and Angelica's swabs, so we ran that through the Scottish DNA database. And unfortunately, there was no match at all, which was disappointing. Despite this seemingly dead end, detectives refused to give up. They took the crucial decision of widening the parameters of their search in an effort to solve the murder. So on the Monday morning, the first port of call was to then search that profile against the National DNA Database in England. And we got a match back within about 10 minutes. Forensic evidence had proved beyond doubt that police had Angelica's killer in custody. But the experience of senior investigating officer David Swindle made him question if an attack as brutal as this could really be the work of a first-time killer. When I saw the ferocity of the killing, what he had put Angelica through made me think, this is someone that has committed a crime like this before and I decided to look at his life very quickly learned that he travelled extensively throughout the UK he had various SIM cards he had lots of cars throughout the decades he had lots of aliases this was a person who had opportunities to commit crime undetected throughout the UK and we really needed to look at him closely. Coming up, the detective's case was building but there was a growing realisation that Tobin was not revealing all he knew. In 2006, 15 years after the disappearance of Falkirk teenager Vicky Hamilton, police have searched this church in Glasgow for any trace of the missing Polish student Angelika Kluk. On the 29th of September, just days after she disappeared, her bloody body was discovered hidden under the floor of the church. Forensic officers had proved that her killer was a convicted sex offender called Peter Tobin, a church volunteer who'd worked alongside Angelika. The case went to trial in March 2007 and Tobin was found guilty of the rape and murder of Angelika Kluke. 
Senior investigating officer David Swindle, however, was so convinced that Tobin had more to tell that he set up a nationwide investigation, Operation Anagram, a decision that would lead to terrifying revelations about one of Britain's most evil killers. Operation Anagram involved every police force in the UK. So basically we're looking at the individual, Tobin, the killer, what happened when he was in an area? Did someone go missing in that area? Was there an unresolved homicide? What did the victim look like? It was a brilliant example of information sharing between police forces. The first connection that David Swindle's team made would be one very close to home in the neighbouring county of West Lothian. Looking into his background, we found out that Tobin had been living in Basgate. And the period he was living in Basgate was the same time as one of the most high-profile Scottish missing persons, Vicky Hamilton. That was when she disappeared and where she had disappeared from. In 1989, Peter Tobin had moved into a house on Robertson Avenue just a five-minute drive away from the town centre location where Vicky Hamilton was last seen alive. Peter Tobin lived in Bathgate from 1989 until 1991, initially with his wife. And during his stay in Bathgate, he was unemployed. It's known that he bought and sold second-hand cars to make some money. And we also know that about six months prior to Vicky Hamilton going missing, his wife left him and that he lived in the house alone. Detectives from West Lothian CID made the crucial decision to search the property to see if they could find anything that would link Peter Tobin to Vicky Hamilton. During the early part of the search, items were being removed from the house. Um, the loft area um, was searched and items removed. During that search, there was a knife found which had fallen down or been secreted between a roof joist and a brick wall. The knife was protected and was forwarded to the laboratories where it would undergo forensic examination. And detectives were also able to call on developments in forensic science to re-examine Vicky's purse found on the streets of Edinburgh some 16 years earlier. These techniques provided two DNA samples on the purse, one on either side. At the time they were found, I was informed that the DNA profiles were male, they were very similar to Peter Tobin's, however, they were not Peter Tobin's DNA. Um, I was able to tell the scientists that Tobin actually had two offspring, two male offspring, and inquiries were carried out with both these men, and the DNA found on the person matched perfectly one of Tobin's sons, who at the time Vicky went missing, he was three years old. The forensic examination then also revealed a piece of skin on the knife which, when examined, produced a DNA profile of Vicky Hamilton. The discovery of the knife was hugely important. The fact that the knife was in the house which Tobin occupied showed that he may have been responsible for her disappearance and possible demise. Tobin already in custody for the murder of Angelica Kluck, was now interviewed about the disappearance of teenager Vicky Hamilton. As Tobin was being interviewed, I was in uh, an adjoining room where I could view the interview on camera. Um, during the interview, I felt that Tobin was very manipulative and at times was trying to control the direction of the interview. Um, the officers had to continually bring them back and bring them back to where they wanted the interview to go. Eventually, Tobin was questioned about the knife that had been found in the loft of the house he used to live in. The knife was produced and he was asked questions regarding it. His initial response was to admit that he had owned a knife similar to that, um, which he did without any prompting at all. Once the significance of the knife was explained to Tobin, he changed the story completely um, and denied any knowledge of the knife. And when the name Vicky Hamilton was brought up, once again Tobin denied all knowledge. When 
Tobin was interviewed in relation to Vicky Hamilton. He became aggressive during that interview. He denied knowing her. Peter Tobin gave up nothing in relation to his involvement or knowledge of Vicky Hamilton. He denied very, very strongly that he had ever seen Vicky Hamilton. He stated that he had never been in her company and he also stated that he was not responsible for her disappearance. It was put to him various things that could link him to her. His DNA was on the knife found in his house at Bathgate, but he was adamant and very controlling towards the officers and quite aggressive towards the interviewing officers that he didn't know. Is there any way that you can assist us in finding this girl now? As I say, I have never met her. The interview concluded with Peter Tobin being charged with the abduction of Vicky Hamilton. Um, at that time, we had not recovered Vicky's body. Despite denying any knowledge of Vicky Hamilton, the forensic evidence was damning. The presence of his three-year-old son's DNA on her purse conclusively linked Tobin to Vicky. Police were convinced that he had been responsible for her abduction, and they could now piece together the teenager's final movements from 16 years earlier. Although it could never be proved, the probability is that she probably stopped Peter Tobin in Bathgate and asked him for directions. Um, a trusting soul um, was Vicky, and I believe that she may have gone with him, thinking that she was going to be helped. Chillingly, it appeared that following the abduction, Tobin had given his young son Vicky's purse to play with. This explained the presence of the son's DNA. But whilst they were confident they knew of her last movements, police were still none the wiser as to the location of Vicky Hamilton's body. And Peter Tobin wasn't going to give up any information voluntarily. As investigations continued in West Lothian, Operation Anagram was still tracking the movements of Peter Tobin. And officers believe they may have found a link between the killer and the historic disappearance of 18-year-old Dinah McNichol, over 500 miles away in southeast England. Dinah had gone away for the weekend to attend a music festival down in Lippook in Hampshire and she'd gone away with some friends to attend this festival. Whilst at the festival, she met a young man um, as a single girl, it was fine. She, she got on very well with this young man. Her friends needed to get back to London um, at the end of the festival, but some campers were staying on for an extra day and Dinah decided to stay on for the extra day with the young man. They left. Neither of them had any money or transport, so they decided that they would hitchhike home. He lived in a different area to where Dinah lived. They got a lift on the A3, and then they parted company on the M25, and that was the last time anyone saw Dinah alive. Police launched a major search for Dinah, but after days of inquiries, they'd found nothing. Her disappearance was a mystery and her family immediately feared the worst. We knew pretty much straight away as that something serious had happened. Back in those days, there was no mobile phones or anything like that, but we were, we were all very good at picking the phone up and ringing in and just saying if we were going to be late or anything at all like that. One of the very few leads that police had was that Dinah's bank cards continued to be used after her disappearance. Back in 1991, they were unable to use this information to pinpoint a suspect. Now, 16 years later, using the latest technology, Operation Anagram was able to place Peter Tobin in the very same towns that the cash withdrawals were made, and, more importantly, at the same time. After leaving Bathgate in 1991, Peter Tobin had moved to the south coast to be nearer his young son. He moved to a house in Margate, and quickly settled into life in the seaside town. He was very friendly. Um, he was very friendly with most of the neighbours. If I hadn't got a tool or something like I wanted to borrow one, yeah, Pete would have it and likewise he would lend one off me. Never had loud parties, never played loud music. In some respects, a perfect neighbour. There was nothing not to like about the guy. We spent most of the summer chatting on his doorstep. 
On one occasion, David Martin had a conversation with his neighbor that would eventually provide vital information for the detectives running Operation Anagram. So I glanced out the top window one day and spotted him digging a trench in the back garden. So being curious, and I went down and, and said, leant across and said, are you going for Australia, Pete? Because it was quite a deep trench. Uh, and he said, no, and he said, I'm building a sand pit for the uh, youngster when he comes up. I said, oh, that'd be nice. So I glanced at it, it looked a wee bit deep for a sand pit, but what do I know about sand pits? Anyway, a couple of days later, it was all filled in. So I said, what happened to your sand pit, Pete? Oh, he said, the social worker said it was dangerous for the youngster. So I thought at the time, well, that's a bit odd. I can understand um, ponds, but not sand pits. But what, I mean, it may be some type of ruling I don't know about. So I never thought any more of it. Then in 2007, we had a visit from the police and they wanted to know whether Tobin did any housework, DIY around the house or anything, or gardening. Um, I had to smile a bit because he never touched the garden as such and then I remembered the sand pit and I mentioned this to them and they seemed to be very interested in that. Now convinced there could be a connection between Peter Tobin and the disappearance of Dinah McNichol, Essex police started an extensive search of the house in Irvine Drive. Essex Police uh, contacted my father, I think they were working in conjunction with um, Scottish Police at the time and so I think they'd received a tip off from, from the police in Scotland and they were going to start to um, investigate the grounds and garden of a property in Margate and they said to us, in, we believe strongly that we are going to find Dinah's remains um, within this, this, this property. They literally took the garden to pieces and we had policemen round the back alleyway, there was police guarding the house, I even had to sign to get in and out of my own house, so it was pretty much a lockdown. The eyes of the nation were on Kent and the police hunt for the body of Dinah McNichol, but the tale of Tobin's nefarious past was about to take another dramatic turn. In the final part of Crimes That Shook Britain, the garden of the house in Irvine Drive reveals its chilling secrets. I was contacted by Essex Police, who informed me that they'd removed the body to the mortuary, but that it was evident that it wasn't the body of Dana McNichol. In 2006, Scottish police charged convicted sex offender Peter Tobin with the murder of 23-year-old Polish student Angelika Kluk. He was found guilty at a high-profile trial in Edinburgh the following year and sentenced to a minimum of 21 years. However, the manner of Angelika's death led detectives to believe this might not have been the work of a first-time killer. An extensive nationwide investigation revealed that Peter Tobin had also been responsible for the murder of teenager Vicky Hamilton 15 years earlier. And police were now concerned there may be a link between Tobin and the disappearance of 18-year-old Dinah McNichol in 1991. Their investigations had brought them to a house in Irvine Drive in Margate, a former home of Tobin's. The Operation Anagram team says more searches will be carried out if the evidence and intelligence coming in from forces across England and Wales warrant it. I was contacted by Essex Police who informed me that they'd removed the body to the mortuary but that it was evident that it wasn't the body of Dinah McNichol. Um, very slowly, due to jewellery worn by the body and physical description, it became very apparent that Although we assumed this was the body of Dave McNichol, it was in fact the body of Vicky Hamilton. Sixteen years after disappearing from the streets of Bathgate in Scotland, the body of Vicky Hamilton had been discovered almost 500 miles away at Tobin's former home in Margate. And just like the murder of Angelica Kluck, all the evidence pointed to a vicious and brutal attack. 
Vicky's body had been dissected uh, and was in two parts, a torso and legs. Um, each part had been placed within polythene bags, um, 13 bags around the torso and 11 bags on the legs. This process preserved um, Vicky's body because it kept the body free from any oxygen. And as such, Vicky was easily recognisable. To find out it wasn't Diana's body was... It, it was a strange feeling because, you know, we, we were expecting them to find it. Um, and then to find out that it was somebody else, uh, in this case Vicky Hamilton, was you know, quite, quite upsetting to, to know that another family would have to go through all of that. The whereabouts of Dinah McNichol remained a mystery, but after 16 years of heartbreaking uncertainty, detectives in Scotland could finally tell Michael Hamilton the truth about what had happened to his daughter. I just broke down. I broke down. I mean, it's, it's no so, I mean, you, you say, you say to yourself, it's, we're never going to see her again, but when you get the news, it, she's dead. That is devastating news, for to be told. No, there's no, there's no day goes by that I don't think about Vicky. I think about Vicky every day, all the time. I mean, I've not just lost Vicky, I've lost grandmains too. I could have grandchildren, you know, and, enjoying their life, them enjoying theirs, and her, but no, no, I never had, I never had the chance to get that one, that or that far, because of the evil woman that he was. The tragic discovery of Vicky's body would finally allow detectives to draw a line under one of Scotland's most high-profile missing person investigations. Our case was now complete with the recovery of Vicky's body, and the further evidence that we found in Margate allowed us then to charge Tobin not only with Vicky's abduction, but also with rape and murder. Back in Margate, police were still convinced that Peter Tobin's former back garden held the key to the disappearance of Dinah McNichol. 24 hours after the discovery of Vicky's body, their fears were realised. There has been a significant discovery uh, within the last couple of hours. Um, there has been another body discovered. There'll be arrangements made this afternoon for a post-mortem. That post-mortem would later reveal that, like Vicky Hamilton, Dinah McNichol had been sedated with anatriptyline, an antidepressant drug that Tobin was known to have been prescribed. Despite the horrific ordeal that Dinah had been subjected to at the hands of Peter Tobin, the discovery of her body came as a great relief to her family. When they informed us that the second remains were Dinah's, it was a massive weight off our shoulders because the, the previous 10, 15 years we'd, we'd not had a body, we'd not been able to, to put her to rest finally, so we were able to hold a funeral. After leaving the music festival in 1991, Dinah and her friend had accepted a lift with Peter Tobin, and when her companion got out of the car near the M25, he could never have known that he was leaving her in the lone company of a cold-hearted killer. Dinah would be 43 years old now. She probably would have had a, a fantastic life. She had everything to look forward to. So, it, it, you know, it, she was cut down right in the prime of her life. In December 2008, Peter Tobin was found guilty of the abduction and murder of Vicky Hamilton. A year later, he was back in court, charged with the murder of Dinah McNichol. The jury took just 13 minutes to reach their unanimous guilty verdict. He received life sentences for both murders, with the judge recommending he should never be released. Today, the judge told the 62-year-old he was unfit to live in human society. Every day, we, we went, went to the trial at Chelmsford Crown Court, and it was the first time I'd got a, a to actually see Peter Tobin. I'd seen photographs of him in the newspapers, but it was the first time I got to see him. And he just looked like a, a, a small, angry old man. When he was sentenced up in Dundee, that was the best day of my life, for a long, long time in my life. Knowing that I'd got him and they put him away and he wasn't going to harm anybody else. Peter Tobin is serving a whole life tariff in Edinburgh prison. He'll never be allowed to seek parole. He will die behind bars. But despite this, he's still never admitted to any of his crimes. 
I've got to ask you the question. Have Go you, and waste your money. Have you killed anyone else? Go and waste your money. Have you killed anybody else? Go and waste your money. You're not willing to answer that. Go and waste your money. It's in the public interest to ask you these questions, Peter. You're well, not willing to cooperate. It's in the public interest that you speak to my you only speak on all these matters. No, I speak to you. The solicitor wasn't you. All right, and no comment. All right, no comment. So you're not willing to answer the last question? No comment. I am confident from what I know about Peter Tobin and the way that he moved throughout the UK, the way that we frequented places where vulnerable people were, and the way he concealed victims burying them. He has killed other people. It has been speculated that he could in fact be responsible for one of Scotland's most infamous unsolved murder cases. Almost 50 years ago, three young women were killed by a man who they'd met at the Barrowlands Ballroom in Glasgow. But David Swindle is confident there is no connection. This is someone, in my mind, that definitely has committed other crimes for what he hasn't been convicted. But there is nothing to link Peter Tobin to the three killings in the 60s, which were labelled the Bible John killings. Nevertheless, Operation Anagram has uncovered jewellery from homes that Tobin previously occupied. Jewellery that contains DNA traces of numerous unidentified females. These profiles will be held on file forever, and David Swindle believes that one day they may unlock the secrets behind more unsolved murders. I always hope that someday we'll get the truth about what Tobin has done for the sake of other families like the parents and relatives of Vicky and Dinah. Throughout his adult life, Peter Tobin appeared to be a helpful and even trustworthy man who was quick to make friends. But in reality, of course, he was a cold and calculating killer who left a trail of destruction in his wake and destroyed the lives of countless families across the country. Peter Tobin is a horrible, manipulative individual who has no respect for life, no respect for families, and only thinks about one person himself. No, I'm not interested, not interested in helping families who might have missed ones that you might have information about. I couldn't give a no, that's it. You have no humanity about you, do you? Oh, have I not? You don't care. He's a convicted rapist, paedophile, murderer, and he's locked up for the rest of his life inside. And I'm just confident that the justice system um, will never let him out and he will have to see the rest of his days behind bars. Peter Tobin didn't just take my daughter away. He took my life away. It ruined my life, as far as I'm concerned. It ruined it completely. I've lost everything. In 1991, a 15-year-old schoolgirl goes missing from the Scottish town of Bathgate. It was devastated. Everybody was devastated. We just we all feared the worst. Just six months later, and hundreds of miles away in the southeast of England, an 18-year-old student would also simply disappear. We knew pretty much straight away when she hadn't come home that something serious had happened. Despite tireless investigations by the police, the whereabouts of both girls remained a mystery until 16 years later, when the brutal murder of a Polish student living in Glasgow would lead to a national manhunt that would uncover one of Britain's most notorious murderers. This is a horrible, dangerous individual that has no respect for life. I'm Dermot Murnahan in the death and destruction wrought by Peter Tobin and the tragic legacy of potentially more as yet undiscovered victims are crimes that shook Britain.
Bathgate in Scotland, just a 45 minute drive from the hustle and bustle of Edinburgh. In 1991, this town would become the central focus of the biggest missing persons investigation in Scottish history, following the disappearance of 15 year old schoolgirl Vicky Hamilton. Vicky was a teenager from the Falkirk area of Scotland, um, a very normal teenager. She lived at home with her mother, her younger brother, and sister. She was educated at high school in Falkirk and was a very popular girl. On the weekend of the 10th of February 1991, Vicky was returning home after a weekend at her sister's house in nearby Livingston. The hour-long journey to Falkirk would require her to change buses in the centre of Bathgate. From the start, she, she wanted to do this on her own. She was getting independent, you know, and wants to go out in the big world, basically. And when she left Livingston that night, uh, her sister put her on the bus, and she got to Bathgate, and after Bathgate, that was it. Nobody had seen her. Vicky alighted from the bus in the steel yard. She was supposed to be going to the bus stop opposite the police station. We know that Vicky started to make that journey. We also know that she went to the chip shop where she bought chips and that she sat on a seat in the steel yard, which was really the last sighting of Vicky. I can remember as though it was yesterday, aye? Eh? Well, it was one of the biggest searches in Scotland. Um, the stop traffic in Bathgate by pamphlets. Spoke to uh, a lot of drivers that left Bathgate that night. Trains that left, buses that left. But I mean, the public were they were really helpful. It was in all the pubs, people speaking about it, you know. And no, there was nothing come of it. The only potential clue that police had about Vicky's whereabouts was found 20 miles away in the Scottish capital. A week after Vicky Hamilton went missing, her purse was found in St Andrew's Square in Edinburgh. The purse was examined at that time forensically with the techniques that were available. Um, however, nothing was found on the purse. With no other leads to follow, extensive inquiries were held on the streets of Bathgate, but the police could find no details about Vicky's final movements. It was devastating. Everybody was devastated. We just we all feared the worst. Uh, we, we knew there's some sinister had happened.